So we just wanted to how do you do a, a season kickoff um, today and, you know, just share a little bit more about Angie. I know we kind of shared about like the NFT process before and like, you know, all that. And so this kind of just like, we'll take you a little bit deeper, tell you a bit more about Angie and her work, um, stuff she's got going on right now, different things like that. So, hey, oh, making food with us. Awesome. Hey, Alessia. Hey, <laughs> Steph. Hey, Shante. Okay. Awesome. Everybody's looking forward to it. I feel like this, we've been recording for, I think, two months. I think we're on session yeah. seven or eight. And, and I'm just like, even if we just publish that, <laughs> it's good. Like, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> Do you feel like that? I, I don't know, because I come off the calls thinking, what was I even talking about? Like, did I just, <laughs> what, was it just completely nonsense? I feel really, really, I was said to my partner after our last session, I just hope it's going to be good enough for the podcast because it feels really, you know, it's just because, yeah, there's been a lot going on as well. So it feels like I've really been just saying all this stuff is happening. So uh, I've loved every single session, but yeah, I hope... <laughs> I just feel like I have it makes sense. I feel like, well, I won't like give away too much and then we'll get into <laughs> specifics, but um, yeah, she said, Shante says fair. <laughs> that would make sense. Um, I, we, you know, we won't give away too much and obviously we'll get into it a little bit more, but the, the thing I want to say to what you just said is like, it feels to me like we're diving into the stuff that is like so important in coaching where mm -hmm. I feel like, um, it's so easy to do the surface stuff. When are you launching next? When is this happening? Mm -hmm. When is this? And I feel like we've been talking more about like identity and vision and like mm -hmm. stuff that feels like, you know, it can almost be like, oh, is that enough value? But it's like, that mm -hmm. is where the value is. And I think yeah. it really aligns to why we decided to like do this season together in the first place. Cause you were kind of yeah. like, I want to get back to just being coached. And I was like, yeah. oh, that like, I don't need to know everything about your industry. Like we just want to coach. And I feel like that's what this, this season has been representative of. Yeah. Yeah. It's El been... Alyssa, Elisa says, so curious to hear about your coaching conversations during the current moment that, moment that Angela is experiencing. I've been watching all your lives. So um, we'll speak to that a little bit today too, because we talked about it and we were like, it feels weird to get on here and not address that. So Alyssa, we'll talk about that a little bit today too. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I, Elisa, I know how to say it. I just said it wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, okay. So let's first start with Angie. Just like, tell us a little bit more about you. Like you have, you know, the floor, so to speak. I know yeah. everyone kind of knows like, you know, the, the one liner about what mm -hmm. you do, but like, take us a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I am, um, a mom and that is my child walking in and out here. So I'm a mom, <laughs> I'm a mom to a nine-year-old boy. Um, and I, um, I am a, a kind of like a single parent, I co-parent with, with his dad. Let's say it like that. That's probably fairest to say. Um, we've been doing that for a long time. So look, for most of the time, well, for all of the time that I've been um, self-employed and, and having my own company, I've been in this sort of parenting, co-parenting role, which has got its own challenges for anybody that's a co-parent. There's like a whole other job attached to that. Um, and I left working in education while I was a school principal for a number of years. And I was a school principal in lots of different places. Um, I left working in education and moved to Denmark four years ago, nearly four years ago. And at that point, decided to set up my own co coaching and consultancy. I probably wouldn't have done if I'd stayed in the UK, but we had yeah. to move for Brexit reasons and stuff. So I ended up being forced into just start the business. So it was, it's quite interesting because I always think about the, if it had been a side hustle, would I have kind of done it in the same way? But there was a point where I just arrived in another country and literally had to say to everybody in my, I remember emailing everybody that I knew and like, does anyone need coaching? Who wants coaching? <laughs> Who's looking for a coach? Which is sort of, I guess, one of the things that I would definitely never have done if it had been a side hustle. Um, mm. And so I kind of did coaching and uh, I was actually, I, I'd written a book on ethical leadership in schools and I was doing lots of work on ethical leadership at the time and doing sort of training and stuff. And then um, just after the murder of George Floyd, people started saying to me, you know, I you used to do DEI work when I was in school, I used to do DEI work and I'd always talked 
um, in terms of my leadership development work about women's experience, particularly black women's experiences of um, seeking progression in the education sector. Um, so I was kind of known in the circle I was in for doing that development work for certain groups of people who held minoritized identities. And I really didn't want to set up my stall as a DEI consultant because it felt like Ed, the world and his wife was and I, it wasn't really, it didn't really feel kind of congruent with what I really wanted to expand into, but people just kept asking and asking and asking. And so I felt like well, I have all this experience, I'm, I'll just do it. But it was interesting, it took quite a long time for it to feel like, yes, this is what I do, and to really feel like I could celebrate doing it. Um, so now I consult with, um, I don't really call myself a coach anymore, I just describe myself as a DEI consultant, and I typically work with educa within education. I work with what's wor work that started as working with schools that now work with groups of schools and across sort of much more kind of system leadership, I guess. And I, the, the, the trail of breadcrumbs is really that I think organizations can bring a greater depth of humanity to the way that they work with people who hold minoritized identities, whatever those identities are. And there's something really about leadership and bringing that work, like bringing a real depth of humanity to that work that I can't distinguish one from the other. To me, that is leadership to show up and to yeah, really yes. honor people's mm -hmm. selves is the leadership. So although I call it DEI work, it, for me, it just feels like a, a continuation. That's another door into how to be better leaders, how to show up on the planet and do better. Um, and I guess I kind of resist in my work any particular label so people will often say oh could you come and run an anti-racism workshop and I'm like yeah well I can but it's part of a bigger picture um, and, and my approach I call the being luminary approach which is the name of my company and I'm really really wedded to that vision of just doing it I call it DEI but it's really a way of a way of being and a way of leading so yeah I work with schools in the UK now in Europe lo lots more schools in Southeast Asia um, and I'm just at the moment kind of branching out towards other sectors um, beyond education because again I think the work is sort of applicable to anyone really and uh, and it's yes it's a exciting times on the threshold of what has been and what I've been used to working in and, and what might be coming down the pike as well. Yeah, it's so good. I'm I'm laughing a little because I like how you're like branching into other sectors like <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about doing less and all of that but also yeah. there's like so also much just doing to everything. do and it's just like this <laughs> funny balance right yeah mm, totally. yeah and I think I, and I was thinking about today it's, it's funny that like people are like oh I really want to hear the behind the scenes conversations of everything that's going on now and I'm like well I had a call with you about three days ago and then since then all of this stuff has happened and it feels like there's also been this sort of kind of I came to you with loads of energy then there's a bit of a hiatus for reasons that will you know people will hear about yes. and then there's a kind of now there's this like <laughs> burst of energy again yes. mm. <laughs> and so it can feel a bit like um it, this is the same feeling I always have in running this business is I'm so passionate about this work that it's sometimes difficult to put the brakes on when I have the energy for it I'm like let's do it all let's change the world this is it this is there's only one life we've got to do it all now and at the same time the, the pragmatism that comes with running a business means of course you can't you can't behave like that <laughs> so just sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the coaching has been like you. you know put the brakes on um, which is kind of interesting Yes, it is. there's more I feel like we can share about that, but everyone's saying like they're really loving this. Shanti said the actual breadth and depth of what bridging humanity with business and other sectors you support. I'm so inspired by your mission. Um, Elisa said she's facilitated leadership trainings for years and wholeheartedly agrees with what you're saying. A couple of people said they were watching your Instagram lives recently. So um, we'll get into that a bit. But yeah, I think that... Um, I think that what's helpful about this season, and maybe we could just, you, you could give your perspective and I can too, like on like what we feel like they're even going to get in the first two months. And mm -hmm. I think what's really helpful is that there's sort of this thread or, or breadcrumbs, like you had said earlier, right. Of like, 
how do I like hold this big mission and big vision and hold myself and my life Mm. and my experience as important too. And like the, the non-balance balance version of like holding all of that. And I think that that's just so relatable for so many of us, because most of us, I like to think anyway, most of us got into this work because we actually care and we actually Mm. have a mission and we actually want to make an impact. And so Mm. then when that comes at our own detriment, sometimes that's really hard to navigate. Mm. Right. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, and it's, it's been so revealing to me that that is the dance that I've, I think loads of us do dance all the time. Like whether it's yep. being a mother and for me, it's like being a mother and also being a co-parent, which means that, you know, I have a lot of time, which is just me and my son and running a business. It's like all, they're all great things. It's all good stuff. But then there comes a point where without knowing it and without you know unless you shed loads of conscious light on it you tip into just doing too much and completely running on overdrive and and that for me has been really interesting about our coaching is that you like having that ballast of okay so are we tipping a bit into this or could you slow down on on this area has just been so important because it's helped me just see how frequently my mind will kind of want to do more yep and want to yeah want to take on more than I really can and at some some points when we've been talking in the last few months it's been quite upsetting almost that I can't seem to put the self-care in place to stop myself from taking on more and doing more um and yeah not not giving yourself a hard time when you when you realize that there's a because we really believe in the work you just you kind of you know really want to do it um but at the same time, we can, yeah, put everything else, put the work and put everything else in front of our own needs. And I'm clearly not very good at noticing <laughs> when well, exactly when that's happening. Yes, yeah, so it's almost <laughs> like, how do we notice that sooner is the dance, yeah. right? Yeah. Versus like noticing it when we're like so far down the track that yeah. like all of the, all of the, you know, symptoms or whatever are there. Um, Shari said she feels like all of her clients can relate. Shante said, yes, she would affirm that. Shante said, oh, this is interesting. I saw your story. I think where you said you have a lot of manifester and Sagittarius energy. Having that slow down has probably been such attraction. Or maybe she meant transition that we get to hear behind the scenes, like the challenge to your identity. Oh, transition. She meant, yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. The Sag thing is real and the manifest thing is real. So um, there's also <clears throat> alongside the work that feels very sometimes I have moments in my work where you know I might look at a news story and think oh I I, like I cannot not change the world this is why I've been put on the planet I have to do this it's too moving too heartbreaking too unbearable to be in this world and to see what happens to people as a consequence of their identity and I have a really well managed pain body around things I really try to kind of put boundaries around it but sometimes it feels too close to my identity too close to the surface too close to people that I care about to not do anything about it so there's there's an element of it that always feels like um well I've got no choice you know I just have to I just have to make the world better it's all very well saying you're tired but meanwhile people are dying so you just have to get on with it there's another element of it, which is that as a manifester, I genuinely have the experience sometimes of like a tap being turned on and then just being <laughs> filled with ideas. I'm like, I've got to do this. And I've got to do this. And, and that is a real felt experience. Yeah. I have notebooks filled with ideas. And then there's also quite a lot of that Jupiterian largesse, I think, of Sagittarius people anyway that yeah, I can take it all on and do it on two hours sleep and have a glass of wine while I'm doing it. And that kind of isn't true when you're in your late forties. Yes. Mm. And also like, I think that that's been some of the identity stuff we've been talking about too, because it's like, that was your identity is it's actually true that I can take all that on. It's actually true that I can hold all of that. And so to have to like rework that as like your ultimate truth is it's a lot right yeah mm. yeah yeah it, it is it continues to be and yeah there have been times when I I feel like I really love that I love being that person that could yeah can do everything and yeah and I um so I'm softening into what it means to not do everything and um and I think that you know the other thing that's come up 
that we've been talking about is that there's a big element that, that is a people pleaser in me as well or that wants to yeah. kind of do yeah do the right do it right do everything right and so this you know the, <laughs> the runaway mouth that wants to do all of these ideas then feels obliged to follow up on <laughs> all of the yes, ideas because then yes, I want, yes. I'm gonna do it right mm. so there's a there's a sort of danger sometimes with you know we've been talking about this with not over promising because ultimately I probably will deliver and can deliver but it will be a detriment to me not um to anybody else so yeah that's been interesting so good everybody's like really feeling you on the, the manifestor bit too and so excited <laughs> for this season Shande said we are so privileged to hear how you're managing through that thank you yes it really mm -hmm. is like I, I I think going to be just so valuable again to almost like get back to coaching. So I think we talked about this in the first live stream, so we don't have to spend a ton of time here, but I think it's important to say again, which is like, I know approximately zero. I mean, now I know more, right? Cause we've been working together for a couple of months, but, but, but prior to us starting, I know approximately zero about like the industry that mm -hmm. Angie works in. Um, and that was one of my concerns, like in, in advance of us working together. And Angie was kind of like, I don't need you to know shit about my industry. I know what I need to know about my industry. Mm -hmm. I need to be coached. And I think that that's something I'm like so excited to showcase this season because I feel like that just gets lost in our industry so much. Like it's so about like, I did this, so do it that way. I know the right thing. You mm. must do this. I have to know. Right. And I think that we have not hit a single wall that, you know, felt weird or crunchy because I didn't know something about your industry. It's like almost felt like the least important part. Mm -hmm. And I just think that like, um, like a reclamation of the idea of like what coaching actually is mm. feels so relevant this season. And I feel like, you know, I want to give you credit on that, Angie, because you were really like the kind of like um, leader of that <laughs> um, uh, trajectory. Because when I said to you, like, hey, I don't know anything about this. Are you sure I'm the right coach for me? You were like, yeah, that's like, I, mm. I got me on that. And I think that mm -hmm. that's really valuable. It doesn't mean that it can't be helpful to have a coach that like knows your industry, but I'm not saying like, don't do that. But I am mm -hmm. saying the idea that that's so pedestaled is like mm -hmm. really not useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I feel like, um, the, uh, as a DEI consultant, I, I could, you know, even a language for me of DEI consultant isn't quite right. And yeah, I work with education, but again, it's not quite right. Because so many of us and so many people I see are now building businesses that are not quite like anything that the industry has seen before. Like you talk about yes, your yes. the partnership model. It's not quite like any nobody was yep. doing it. You're the first person to do it. There are things that I do in my work that people can say, can you come and work with me? I need to do I consultant. And I'll just have to say, I'm sorry that like what you're looking for it you need to go and find a corporate organization who do those things because i don't do those things i work in a particular way i'm just finding the closest language to describe what i do yes. but it isn't really quite adequate to describe what i do and i think that that puts the coaching industry in terms of the do what i do and then you'll have the like do the same exact same thing as I, that i'll do and then you'll have the business that makes you loads of money in a bit of jeopardy because people seem to be forging little kind of their own orbits of things that are just completely different and that means that pure coaching where the person who is the business owner who has a vision for what they want to achieve becomes really relevant because I need the mirror I yes. need the bounce I need to feel like I am sovereign and I know what I want to achieve and I can see where I want to get to but I don't know if I'm going about it in the right way and what I yes. need is to bounce back with somebody around some of those things and so for me that's that's the joy of it is not having all of the industry standards or the people who know what happens in my space or any of that not having any of that narrative available even yes I mean I think that's so true because there is such like a mentality I think across our space that's basically like do what I tell you to and if you don't that's the problem mm. kind of thing yeah. and I think you have such a clear vision for what you want and of course I'm gonna sometimes reflect like <laughs> when Angie and I first started you guys will hear this but she I was like send me a document of like what you're doing on a weekly basis kind of thing and she instead sent me this document that was like every idea that she's like <laughs> currently in the midst of trying to move forward. And I was like, no, this is a lot. Right. And so like, you could be a mirror in that way, but it wasn't like these strategies are wrong. You must now do it my way or whatever. It was more like, yeah. okay, like 
I, based on what you ultimately want for your life, I don't know that this is like serving you to have all of these things on your plate. There, that's such a different conversation than no, you shouldn't be running this strategy because I've never done it or my clients haven't had success with that or whatever the F. And Mm -hmm. like, I think that's what's so different. I feel like even on our last coaching call, what we kind of landed on in terms of like marketing strategy for you is almost entirely against what I would say 99% (laughs) of the coaching industry would say is like a strong marketing strategy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and that makes it feel like, oh yeah, we're really working on my business. We're not working on- all the businesses and we're not working on somebody else's business and I'm copying that we're really working on my business and it allows for those moments of real kind of awareness of yeah what really resonates like the, when we were talking about that marketing strategy it may not be it's also nothing I've ever heard because that's not what's being modeled in the rest of the industry yeah. so yeah. it's like oh I've never heard that how validating for somebody else to say well how about we try this and I can go oh yeah that actually feels really good for what I'm trying to achieve yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a really nice space to be in um, at this point. And that kind of combination of slowing down to scale and all of those things that then I can, you know, that, that, that there's space to, to talk about also feels like we're back to pure coaching. We're not just in the scale, 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 scale kind of situation. And um, it, it, it actually feels like, just luxurious amounts of time to talk about <laughs> my yeah. business which is yeah what um, okay I'm gonna read <laughs> yes I'm gonna read comments and I want to say something else there and then I have a couple other points I want to make sure we touch on um but Shari said she's had that conversation with a few clients before signing as well and like resonates um and even found that it made it easier to stay in the coaching lane which I think totally makes sense um and Lacey said similar takes a lot of pressure off the coach too we show up to support our clients but don't have to know everything mm. exactly mm. um very IFS therapy model which I also love yep totally and then Alyssa said thank you for the short wait between seasons you're so <laughs> welcome so I think I want to be really clear and like Angie and I have talked about this we talked about this in the other live stream too like we are not putting this coaching on a pedestal either but I do feel like it, it's almost backward to what you hear in the industry, but I think this is a really good model for it. So I just want to name it, which is like, I feel like we hear all of this conversation that you guys, if there's like one thing that gets under my skin in the coaching industry, it's this, this idea that your clients are, are so self-responsible that like they should take care of absolutely everything by themselves. And if they need something from you, they have like missed the point like that. Nothing bothers me more in coaching than that. Because it's like, well, then why are they hiring you? If they are that perfect and self-responsible and self-led, why in the world do they need support? Like the point of support is to feel partnership, to feel the bounce. To feel... But I feel like, Angie, you are such a good example of what I think the maybe essence of that conversation in a really like, you know, in integrity place is, which is like a client being self-responsible, being sovereign, realizing that like, they're bringing a certain thing to the table and then the coach is bringing a certain thing to the table. And for me, that's Mm -hmm. what partnership is too. And so again, it's not to say like, watch us as the perfect model for this by any means. But I I do think that on the light side and not the dark side where it's manipulative, Mm -hmm. but like on the light side of of have self-responsible clients, like I think you're a really good example of that. Where like, you know what you need from me as a coach, you know what's going on in your industry, you know what your vision is. And so then it's like really easy to give great support, but it's also really easy to then be like, you're good, handle it, (laughs) you know? And I just think that that's the point I want to make here and hopefully showcase a bit in our season is like, you can have a very sovereign and self-responsible client and have a coach that is still in partnership and showing up and cares. And those aren't like mutually exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a balance there for, for uh, as the person that's investing in the coaching and the t- like in the time and the, in the whole you know the whole thing for me is about I also want the coaching for something I, I don't yes. I'm not just like oh okay let's just have a chat, let's just chat. yeah yeah like, yeah you know there is a there's a there it, it needed to feel like partnership and like it's getting somewhere and I'm yes. getting somewhere and that requires um, uh, yeah as you say that kind of work on both sides to 
to show up and, and be in partnership and to kind of continue to, <laughs> even though it's not easy to, to really look at some of the things that you've brought up, that you've brought yeah. to me and, and shown me about myself. Um, which is funny because it's like, although it hasn't felt at all like therapy, it reminds me of that, you know, when, you know, I've had therapy years ago and, and when it works, it's like, it was so much work for me. I have to yeah. really like <laughs> do work. Yes. yes, it's so true. Mm. <laughs> and I think that's the thing. Like when we talk about a self-responsible client, I think that you just hit the nail on the head. Like there is work around that. So of course we want someone that's like willing to show up and acknowledge that like the coach isn't going to like wave a magic wand and then everything works or, or therapist or whatever. But it doesn't mean then coach does nothing. And I think that's what we have to like talk about more, you know, that like shared responsibility, shared results kind of situation. So I feel like that's important. And it also kind of leads us into, well, I feel like there's a couple of ways we could take this. The one thing I want to say before we maybe take it into like what has been happening for Angie for the last, um, I don't know, four, uh, four days um, is well, a couple things. One is last time we did the live stream. I just want to like make note of this and acknowledge this. So last time we did the live stream, we were talking about Angie being um, the first black woman on the podcast and how excited we are about that. And I want to talk about that for a second, but I also want to name that Angie is actually not the first woman of color on the podcast. Michelle Streeter was, and I missed naming that last time. And I take responsibility for that. And I just want to make sure that's super clear. Angie is our first black woman on the podcast. Michelle was our first woman of color. It all matters. It's all important. This is not like a, this or that thing. I just didn't name it last time. I take responsibility for that. So just want to say that um, Michelle was season. Oh my God, five or six. I don't know. I can't count. Um, I think she was six, six. Um, but anyway, just wanted to name that. So, so one thing, Angie, I feel like I would love to hear you just talk about a little bit is just the, the experience you had in thinking about like being the first black woman on the podcast that kind of like, did that matter to you? Did it not matter to you? Like, did that feel relevant? Just a little bit about that. Mm. Yeah, it did. It, it, and does, um, continues to feel relevant, um, you know, and, and also really links to all of the stuff that's been happening this this last week and also to my work. There's something about visibility, um, the visibility of people who hold minoritized identities that's yeah. always going to matter to me just because of my work. And, and I think witnessing the process that unfolds um, for people who look like they're in a similar situation, um, witnessing the process that unfolds for people when they hold different minoritized identities, um, even when it feels like they're in the same situation, like, oh, you're a self, you're a business owner, yes. you're a coach and you run your own business and you run your own business. I think that's really important because my internal kind of lived experience of being a business owner and being a coach and being a consultant and operating in the kind of fringes, I guess, of the corporate space, in terms of like the education sector is not really corporate, but yeah, it, 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 um, it means a really different thing when I inhabit this skin that I'm yes. in. It, it, it just does. My, my world is really different. The way that I interact with people becomes really different. And so I don't really ever perceive barriers in my life in this, in the sense that I think that the odds are, I don't think about the odds being stacked against me. However, I do recognize that to navigate a lot of the things that people navigate who are racialized differently to me, I have to do a lot more work. And it's not like, I'm not naturally, because I'm a black woman, I'm not naturally gonna get the same number of followers um, on social media. I'm not naturally gonna have people trust in my authority. I'm not naturally gonna have people think, yeah, she looks like the coach for me because I don't naturally necessarily fit into people's idea of you look a bit like me and you probably get my worldview and that's there's so much of that is is unconscious of course, yeah. and mm -hmm. is you know is is not it's not at all in people's consciousness often so I spend a lot of time in my work uncovering those patterns in organizations but it also means that I have a really different experience of running my own business and so for me this is also an opportunity to have a window into that 
actually more for um, other um, other women, in particular women of colour, I think to see that and to have that validation is just yes. so important to just go, oh yeah, there's somebody else who kind of has a similar experience to the one that I have. And it's and it really is possible, it really is possible to run a business. And it's also possible to run a business and to do all of these things with a great sense of sovereignty and sometimes even optimism and sometimes humor and all of those things like you it absolutely have to bring be those. <laughs> yes. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's yeah, it is it does mean a lot. Yes, I think that's so important. And I feel like that's something that I know about you that you has always been meaningful to you, like whether it was in the now having your own business, but even when you were like teacher to school principal to all of that, like I think you have always really felt that like. I don't know if the word is um, responsibility, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but to like pave the path, right? Like yeah. you've really always kind of taken that on. So I feel like this just like, this just tracks with like how you've always yeah. kind of done it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think I'm loath to use the phrase, so I'm not going to use it. But there were people, you know, talking about being models of what's possible in the world and stuff like that. And I think yeah. there is a, there is something that's just very heartening and reassuring when we see people who are, who are treading the path that, yes. that we've trodden. And I still think um, I'm really lucky to have a sort of disposition and a confidence that means that I don't find, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky I have lots of privilege. So um, I don't feel um, compromised by laying bare the some of the things that operate in my life I've never felt compromised yes. by them I try to use them as teaching opportunities really so um yeah yeah and I and just one other thing I guess I would say is that there are times when people who hold minoritized identities don't get the chance to be heard so yeah you know in the literal sense just being on a podcast literally sort of being yabbering heard, yeah. on mm. is like oh okay here she is being here as somebody who looks like that being heard which means something as well yes I love that the we we named this before but it just feels important for me to keep saying this and then Shari has a really good question that I'm going to copy and you can answer after but um mm. One thing that um, Angie and I had talked about, um, okay, got it, sorry. Um, one thing that Angie and I had talked about that I feel like I just wanna get, keep making sure we're clear about naming is that I feel like in her making the decision to come on the podcast, it can almost also feel like she's like, you know, a black woman and a DEI expert and she's like giving me like this stamp of approval or something. And I wanna be super clear, that's not what's happening here. Like, this is not like, now Lacey is the pillar for safe space or something like that. I obviously am doing my own work. I obviously, that's important to me, but I just, again, I think it's super clear that it's, this isn't like also a thing where like it comes with this like check mark or something. Yeah. This is like, Angie knows she has permission if I am ever not showing up in that way to um, speak to it, correct it, address it. And I think that's actually what's important here. And I mean, mm -hmm. you know, has not been something that has come up on the podcast yet, but doesn't mean that it won't be. And I think that that's just important to say too, because I feel like because you're paving the way, then it can also feel like, well, that's gold standard and that's not it either, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's always something that I have to take care of. And again, yeah. even, you know, in my previous roles, when I was showing up and being the, oh, Andy Brown, she's a school head teacher. I was one of the three percent of black head teachers in the UK when I was a head teacher when I was a school principal, and and so I was probably one of one of the 0.5 percent of black female head teachers in the UK right. when I was when I was a school principal, and so often it was like she's paving the way, she's doing it. Apparently, I've heard that she's bringing up a child on her own, and you know all of this kind of stuff, and people would be like, how how do you do it? One of the things I always used to say is, um, not very well. Yeah. with a lot of exhaustion and you know don't make me a model of exactly yes. <laughs> doing it exactly it's well. like the pedestaling so, thing yeah mm. it, that that's not going to be helpful and that, and that she can gaslight people into situations that aren't good for them either so not that <laughs> that would happen with you but I think no, that, I, you know, I agree with that kind of, yes yeah, mm. it's not a yes that's it everybody can now go and, and blaze you know follow this trail it's just to say I am an example of somebody that's doing something in this way and and that means that often my clients will be going and they'll be 
you know, I might say I've written a book and, and other people might be clients who are going off to write some blog posts or going to set their own kind of, you know, web page up, whatever it is. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to go and write a book and it doesn't mean that everyone's going to go and get a book deal either. So, yeah, it's a bit of sort of care yes. around those. Perfectly said. Okay. So let's answer Shari's question and then let's talk about your last few days. <laughs> um, okay. So Shari said, can you share how you're both thinking about investing in high ticket coaching, not for sales or growth, but for balance, personal identity work? Does that ever feel hard to your, does that ever feel hard to your brain or does it just feel obvious that they are connected? Um, well, I'll share my take and then you can share what you think Angie, but I feel like, I think Angie does very much want growth. Mm. Mm. It's just that the way to it is maybe different than it seemed. It looks like going for more balance and personal identity work, I think, as the path. Because, I mean, you'll obviously hear more about Angie's business, but it's like growth. Growth is very available, but I think it's more like you were feeling like you were wanting to slam the brakes on the growth because some of the other balance stuff wasn't there. So I guess to answer that question really specifically, Shari, to me, it feels super connected. It feels almost like the growth is still the goal, but there are many paths to get there. And so this path happens to be one of more balance and personal identity work, but I don't think that that removes the goal, but I'm curious what you think of that, Angie. Mm, I completely agree. Hi, Shari. Um, So I would say that I couldn't grow, I can't grow with the current sort of um psychology I guess that I bring to um to being a business owner there is a there is a there is a naturally going to be a ceiling um (laughs) on how far I can grow because my whole my whole mindset around this has been I'm a grafter I'm a grafter I'm a worker I can you know and it's not exactly hustly but it is come from a long line of women who work very hard who put in all of the hours as a woman of color my my career path has been very much based on my work being better than everybody working harder than everyone putting in loads of hours and so it it isn't a helpful psychology to build a business that actually truly breaks you know because I I always had this mantra I want to break generational poverty and I want my son to not have have to think about money that was my main that's my only mission really and breaking generational poverty is not just about money it's also about the way that we get the money so really the poverty is like the scarcity the thoughts of if I don't work this hard then there's never going to be anything coming in so for me the whole thing is kind of tied up and I know that growth exists at the next level which isn't about me sacrificing myself to the extent that I do and so I guess I would always say that I I would invest in the personal development side of Mm. things much more than the strategy that it Mm. takes to grow because I don't think there is one I think there were probably many 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 and uh, I have a really felt sense of what mine will be but as Dr Joe Dispenza tells us we don't know exactly how it's going to come to us (laughs) (laughs) could be could be a multiple of different multitude of different things that you hadn't yet expected so I feel like I will always invest in myself but then that takes a lot of discernment because, you know, the weight of the investment and all that. <laughs> yes. Which interestingly enough brings us to, I think our last point, which we didn't, you know, we're not going to spend like a, a ton of time on this because mm. Angie has already put a ton of time on this. And I really wanted this to, to showcase her and, and all of the amazing things that she's bringing to the podcast. But Angie has had quite a big um, few days. I will let you tell this Ooh. part of the story. I don't need to, but um I just want to name that this isn't like a, like a a place for gossip. This is just a place for Angie to very clearly state what's been going on with her, because I think that it would be weird to show up here and not mention that. I'm sure many of you have seen what's been going on and it feels like it wouldn't be right to not give that voice either. So the floor is yours, my dear. I will interject with questions, but if you just want to give us like a quick little rundown. Yeah. Yeah, So I, I think we alluded to it in the first live stream that basically I kind of started this coaching engagement with Lacey partly because I'd invested in a mastermind and I didn't name it. And I was, it was a 200 K mastermind. So a number of people have kind of, you know, I think I've talked about that. Um, I'm, I'm really my, feeling of being very disappointed in investing quite a lot of money from as as far as I was concerned a lot of money in a mastermind and um, not feeling like the product met 
the um the description yeah not the promise and the kind of you know as build um and so I I kind of came to Lacey feeling like oh this is you know full of I don't know full of shame but definitely kind of feeling really burnt Mm. and really regretful and feeling like thank goodness I'm resourced enough to not make this a huge massive deal um but I did I did contact the company and say that I wanted a refund for the product because I feel like it wasn't it wasn't as advertised and I was um and that that was not met with um yeah I couldn't I didn't get anywhere basically with that request so um and I've made a live stream about the kind of reasons that I didn't think the product met met the build description um and so when I saw and you know we're sort of seeing people in the industry talking a lot at the moment I saw um actually saw a podcast that um, Life Coach School put out about values and you know, I had a similar response really because I've been part of some of the programs there as well and not necessarily felt the values kind of singing from singing from the pages and all of those experience and I, I saw a post um, posted by the CEO of the company running the 200k mastermind um, and it was about haters and it was a kind of really disparaging post about people um, effectively disagreeing with her or with the company's mission or you know um or their work being haters and it just really kind of I I, again had that experience of I don't really want to respond to this because I don't want to get into it but I will say that one of the reasons that I didn't want to respond to it is also because of the massive amount of peer pressure that's out there in our industry that do I really want to be the one that in this sea of people saying yeah yeah you go girl this is great do I want to be the one that is saying well actually I disagree and these are the sorts of things that keep me up at night like I'll I'll get in trouble I'll say the wrong thing it doesn't feel it doesn't feel safe always to say those sorts of things because it's like the world is gaslighting you when everybody thinks that something is great and you're having a really different experience of it so I tried to be incredibly measured about the way that I commented on it and just said you know I don't feel like I'm a hater because I don't hate you but I do didn't like the product and I think there's an interesting thing there about whether we separate ourselves from our businesses because that's what I was going to say you even intentionally named that yeah. in your comment to say like yeah. I I do not hate you in any way this is not even about you personally yeah. this is truly about like a product that I was yeah. delivered and I think that that's so important to name and I think it's yeah. important how you did that mm-hmm. yeah and and I think it's important for me to think if people can complain about my product they can say you know your program mm. oh, it fell short of this and I hope that I could take it with a good grace that that it's meant that you need to improve this bit of it I don't think I myself would feel particularly threatened by that as an individual or a human and so what happened was that comment was deleted which literally I've gone from like I was furious in January I was kind of pissed in February I was furious again in March and then I let it go and I just was like <laughs> right back up <laughs> to now I'm pissed <laughs> because I wasn't and now I really am because there has to be a space in our industry there has to be a level of resilience and tolerance for people who don't do not agree with us in the coaching industry where we're talking about the ability for you know I feel like coaches have to hold such powerful space for people it is particularly infuriating when we can't even get that first past that first layer of defensiveness to me anyway I've always found it really irritating so when my comment was deleted I just thought this is a racket this is like (laughs) there's no there's no way of getting in to this And, and I recorded a I recorded a live at which point I realized a lot of my rage you know <laughs> surfaced again and I I don't think I you know I tried not to be particularly rageful it was lucky I was in an airport lounge so I couldn't actually shout <laughs> there was no shouting there was no shouting aloud um and I and I just said you know I I am not a hater I'll say it again I'm not a hater I did not like the product and I went tried to be very careful about saying this is my experience of the product and I have framed this from the beginning as something that you could apologize about at the time and after you refused to apologize I then said that I I want a refund and when you refuse to give me a refund I'm kind of left in a situation where I have to seek some other form of recourse and so after I recorded the live I was then sent an email saying that I'd been removed from the mastermind and ejected from the from the Facebook group so I no longer have access to with no refund yeah in fact that was the Hobson's choice I was given at the beginning was I could either leave the group 
with no refund or stay in the group with no refund. <laughs> That's what I thought was an interesting refund policy. Um, so now I'm flooded with people in my inbox who have had similar experiences and lots of the people that have been uh, contacting me over the weekend have been people who have been really burnt in this in the same space or in other spaces and who have really felt like they don't have the confidence or the courage to speak up and look, that word courage keeps coming up so people keep saying you're, you're being really courageous and I just want to say again I don't feel like I'm being courageous because I'm actually quite annoyed but I don't feel like don't feel like don't feel like I'm being threatened yeah, but it does speak yeah. a lot to the experiences that people have where they yeah. actually like people are suffering from PTSD. People are taking anxiety medication. People are having all sorts of experiences as a consequence of some of the things that are going on in our industry around how people are treated, which affect, you know, in, in my line of work, this is narcissism. It is narcissistic bullying. It is gaslighting. Some of the worst behaviors that, you know, you would expect to see as a therapist working in in family counseling family dynamic stuff like relationship counseling but we really don't expect to see when we're handing over sometimes 25k to people and be experiencing time and time again so i've been really shocked and appalled by what's happening in the industry and once again feel like i have this i feel like i had get these call to action from the universe that says like now you need to do something about it because it it moves me to tears to think about what's going on for some for some of these people. It's just it's just not okay. So that's what's been going on this weekend. <laughs> so Angie has been quite vocal about this, and I think so many people are just saying how inspiring they found it and how it's given them some permission to maybe speak up in other ways. And mm. and I think that the thing that I feel like is really important mm. to say here that I I feel like well there's so many things I could literally we have like nine more minutes so we're not going to talk yeah. about this forever but the thing that I do feel like is really important to say here is I feel like people get funny about this stuff because it's like coaching is so um intangible in many ways and so I think mm. people get really funny about like well, like, how can you say for sure if the product was good or not? Like, did you just mm -hmm. not receive it in this way? And da, da, da. And I really think the thing that is so important here is we are talking about an, an actual stated promise mm -hmm. and that thing actually not being delivered. And so I feel like for anyone that, because I think there's two sides to this story. Mm -hmm. I think there's the side of like, like, let's have this conversation. And I think there are people that feel really, um, stress because they're like, wait, how do I know if I've upset someone and maybe mm. not delivered it? And I think the, the point here is, is like, this is not a giant request to deliver on what you say you are going to mm. deliver on. And then if not to have a reasonable conversation, mm -hmm. um, if that yeah. does not occur. Yeah. And so I feel like it, this can swing so far one way or another. Yeah. And I think what has been so beautiful about watching your navigation of this, Angie, is I feel like you have really kept it about the product and not the person, about the promise and not like your expectations. Mm. And I think that that is what we need more of in the coaching mm. space is this middle of the road conversation that brings two sovereign people <laughs> to the table, right? And not, mm. you know, just kind of like uh, one, one, one side or the other wins. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, as, as a coach, as a consultant, I'm definitely working with people who are like, who are going to be, oh, I'm not sure about that session, or this didn't really ring true for me, or that yes. doesn't, or I don't appreciate this, or I don't like the way you're talking about this, Angie. And I get feedback of that kind all the time. I'm working with identity. People are constantly telling me they don't like the way yeah. I said this, or they don't like it. Or when I say this, I make them feel uncomfortable. I get so much feedback. My job as the person who is being paid to do the work is to really take that on is to say, okay, so let's work through that. And it's hard, it's horrible. It's, you know, I want you want everyone to love things, but it's a different thing to somebody saying, Do you know what, Angie? For the last six calls that you've done, we haven't been able to hear any audio. <laughs> so we we so didn't get any audio. of the learning yeah. <laughs> because we couldn't hear. Like it's a it, these are two different things. Yes. And I think that. We all then equally have things in our business where, you know, if I, if I said, you know, I cancelled three sessions in a row and they were only getting six sessions, it would be valid for somebody to say, well, you actually only delivered 30, 50% of the sessions. And it, it, it isn't about 
the the kind of enjoyment of the coaching or the enjoyment of the consultancy or the level of challenge or the teaching materials or the methodology it then just is a case of you know the contract says six sessions you delivered three so I think yeah keeping it away from expectations and into the yes. factual it's factual. really what I'm talking and about that's what here, you've yeah. been so great at keeping this about I think um uh, Michelle said it brings me back to what I always say about how we don't always get things right, but we always make it right. Exactly. I think mm. that that's, that's it. Like, and Shari was saying how you respond is 90% of it. And I think that's yeah. so true. Like you would have never in a million years done that live. If there had been even the, the slightest open door in that response nope. and there just wasn't, um, no. Shari said, how am I hold me as in Lacey, how am I holding um, support with my own position and values through this. And when it comes up for past clients, I mean, to be honest with you, like, and I think this is also just, again, an important thing in terms of like this, this dynamic we're saying in terms of like actual coaching, sovereignty, all of that, like Angie didn't come to me and go, should I do this live? <laughs> like it there, like, or I didn't go to her and say, you know what you should do is just go live and talk about it. Like, and so I think that's just important to name because mm -hmm. what, what I'm here to hold space for is whatever Angie wants to do with it. If she wanted to drop this and never speak a word of it again, like, obviously I could hold the belief that like, oh, but I would love for you to speak up about some of this in our space, but that's, she gets to make that choice just like she got to make the choice to go live. So for me, my role is to like be neutral, I think, and, and not neutral in the side of like, I, I obviously like very much, um, agree with Angie's position, but neutral in the sense of like, however she handles it, I'm just here to like support her processing in that. And I think that's, what's really important and, and do whatever I can to support her as the business owner and the individual, that kind of thing. But I think that that, and same with past clients that have had that similar experiences in different ways too, like I think we just have to remove ourselves from mm. it mattering. Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm explaining that quite right, but it's like, it kind of, it's not mine. It's like, it's mm. Angie's just like, however she decides to handle a client, I'm going to support her in or whatever. Does that make sense? Mm. Mm. And you've been really good at that. I mean, you've known about it from the beginning. Cause I think even before we started coaching, yeah. I've said, this is the experience that I've had and you're not making it your thing which makes it infinitely easier for me to then work out how I actually want to deal with it it's not like you're kind of whoop whoop yeah let's you know there's been you you literally haven't said you're like what do you want to do about it and we've talked about it at different points but I think the you know what's been really interesting is that the voice that I hear of you in the back of my head is don't take on loads of stuff that isn't your stuff yeah so that's like really for me there's a kind of because this could be a moment where I'm like getting involved with everybody's complaint of true, this and, that and, the other. That's and actually a, a bigger part of me is saying well you know my I think there's a load of stuff that needs to be addressed but I don't necessarily I don't have to be the person to address all of yeah. that stuff that everybody's bringing there is a very specific track for me which is about the product and you know there might be another group of people who also feel exactly the same way then okay we can you know maybe talk the same you know about the same complaint but otherwise I could see myself in pre I've literally had Lacey's voice in, in my head going <laughs> you do, do you need to you know do you need to take on an ethical coaching pledge no I don't think you do do you <laughs> do you need to do any of these things you you really don't and so tempering the kind of enthusiasm yeah. to get involved in everything which has been super helpful I love that Okay. I have to go in two minutes because I have a call with yeah. Michelle, literally guys. But yeah. I do want to say this because I think that this is really important to name. Um, I'm trying to think of how I want to frame it quickly, but what I really want to say, and I think that um, Angie has done a beautiful job of navigating this. And I just want to make sure from my role, I'm naming this really clearly too, is like, this is not like now I am better than that past coach. Like, oh, Angie had that bad experience. And now she's having this good experience. And so that's down here. And now this is pedestaled up here. Like they're just not even like in the same room kind of thing. And I think that's important to say, like this conversation isn't to say like, and look at us now or like whatever mm -hmm. is to say, like, this is just this separate thing that she has to address. I see my role as like, how to learn from what did not feel good to her there so that I can, of course, give her a different experience, but not in the sense of like, because I am good and ethical and this other person is bad and evil. And like, I just think that's so important because mm. the way we move these conversations forward is to not like other yeah. all of this and to not yeah. make someone better or someone yeah. really bad. And I think you've just done a great job 
naming that. And I just want to like say that here from my perspective. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I completely so agree. Yeah. No I adore you. Needed. <laughs> I you adore you. <laughs> the best. You guys are going to love this season more to come for sure. Um, it, it airs June 21st, first episode. Um, so yeah, you guys are going to love it. I just feel so confident mm-hmm. in saying that. And I just really appreciate you, Angie. I feel like this is just it's just been such a gift so far and I just can't wait to see where it goes. Mm. Thank you, my dear. Oh, can you do me one quick favor, Angie? Um, when we jump, will you just put links for people like to your Instagram, mm-hmm. your website? Like I just want to sure, make sure. sure they can follow yeah. you in all the places. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys, have a beautiful week. Bye y'all. Bye. Bye.